Hi, welcome back. It's finishing up chapter two, and Kichuan really gets into what will eventually become his thesis statement. But it starts off as saying, okay, we are ultimately looking to find what are suitable flows, right? And how can we characterize those, and what are they, you know, the features of it? And, and really, this is a combined aerodynamics and propulsion point of view. And so the, the first point, it says, and this makes sense, it's just that it's steady and stable, right? That's kind of maybe, maybe obvious, but um, you, know, you, you don't want to have your flow field, uh, that your aircraft has to have a flow field that's constantly changing. That doesn't make a ton of sense, right? For the most part, air is steady and you're flying into it. Uh, and then stable, right? So certainly, yes, we have things like turbulence or things that might, might disrupt that. And so you want to have stability there. And, and then furthermore, you know, we'll get into things like aircraft stability that will need to have certain features to be flyable, like certain flying qualities, okay? Makes sense. Um, and that's a bit of what that means as controllable, right? That we have the ability to do things like trim or, uh, you know, climbing, turns, all, all of those pieces. And, and certainly as we get into it, you know, when we talk about wanting to take off and land from a runway, certainly that's what Venus is trying to do, but th th that will... Uh, imply its own characteristics onto the vehicle, um, things like crosswind component and you know stall speed, things like that. Okay. And then you have to have um, smooth gradients. And you know this for the most part means nothing nothing sharp. Um, it's it's a bit. I can look at this statement and say that's that's a little bit back to stability and controllable, but um, but it's understandable, right? That you want to have um, necessarily um, sharp gradients. Now, a shock is its own kind of sharp gradient, and um, that's not what he means here. But just from a, a suitable flow point of view, smooth gradients, and then efficiency. Okay, and efficiency, of course, will have a few different meanings, but we we know already this is the propulsive efficiency, and we're going to get into this a little bit more. This will also mean the, kind of the lift to drag, that's that aerodynamic efficiency. And furthermore, you know, you want to have thin wakes. Okay. Um, we, we know this from you know, vortex shedding. One of you, like, vortex shedding can be pretty unstable for, for one, but also if there's a very large wake, it can be, it's going to have a huge, a huge drag. Okay. Um, and then, uh, boundary layer is kind of the next piece, right? This, this is all true, um, and then when we get into the boundary layers, when we get into the, the viscous portions of the flow, we we want to have a few features of these boundary layers, namely that they're thin. That's it's a little bit back to drag. Maybe that's kind of a parallel statement. Um, but low low friction is nice, and we're gonna see that. Yes, laminar is what we want, but it's not really necessarily achievable. There's a few aircraft, in fact, there's a really, there's a really fun looking aircraft uh, that's flown out of Mojave that's trying to do kind of fully laminar flow. It's, it's impressive. Um, for the most part, that the speeds most aircraft are flying at and the altitudes is not achievable, but Kuchumat even mentions that actually at some high speeds, high altitudes, you, you may uh, spurt being able to see laminar again. And, and absolutely, that's what I've seen as well. So. A big thing for you know, anybody chasing high-speed flight, that, that's a big bucket if you can hit it. Okay. Uh, you need to be able to overcome pressure gradients. Um, and I'll just say overcome grad P. Why is that? Um, so you can think of that even from the compressor blades and from the a jet engine, right? You're, you're, you're pressurizing. Um, and so as you're pressurizing, you're adding pressure, so there's a pressure gradient. And that's why, say, you know, an axial flow turbine can only have so much pressure gain per stage. Is any more, you actually will get separation behind those airfoils. Um, and so the, if you want to be able to overcome pressure gradient, it's actually what you, <laughs> what you want is turbulent. It, it's a little bit different than this, right? Uh, some airfoils will have really high uh, you know, lift to drag, but it's a pretty massive pressure gradient. And so... Um, You'll, you'll achieve those L over Ds if you're turbulent. So you might even have turbulent trips in front of it to help make sure it's turbulent. Uh, and the famous one on this is actually the golf ball. That's why the golf ball has dimples. It's actually to force a turbulent boundary layer such that the wake is thin. 
That's that set. Pretty, pretty neat one. Um, low heat transfer. Low heat transfer. That becomes become very important as we get into higher speed flights. For sure, that's going to be a very big deal. And then, uh, again, when you talk about low heat transfer, I'm going to put back in here laminar. So, again, you, you see sort of laminar showing up twice, and it, it's going to be a big piece of this. Right? So, so even as Kuchiman seen in the 1970s, when, when we start framing out what does high-speed flight really looks like, you know, that there's absolutely, the, from this analysis point of view, you're going to see the features that we're looking for uh, just through the analysis. And that's part of what makes all of this uh, important. And then there's the final portion of this, which is energy addition. Right? You have to add energy into the, into the flow. And so propulsion is, is not just this magical thing that gets bolted on. In fact, as we get into chapter three, kind of the second half of chapter three is all about propulsion systems. And even you know, just the simple approach of, of I have a disc, <laughs> in this duct I have a disc, and the disc is adding momentum, that would be like a propeller. And you can, you can already back out all sorts of features that you need out of that flow field. Or you could say this disc is adding heat, that's a burner. Um, if it's a supersonic flow, you could actually, no kidding, you could really think of that as in terms of a detonation front. But there are absolutely features that come out of those by just looking at what, you know, what are the features of this energy addition that need to happen. And you have to do it, right? You have to, have to overcome. We're not building, not building gliders here. Okay? And so really the chapter then ends with ultimately kind of these building blocks into the final thesis statement. And you know, it's yeah, he had a little bit of an introduction, but it's nice to kind of have think of all we've kind of covered on chapter one and chapter two to kind of round it up before we then gonna do deeper dives into more physics, right? There'll be more equations as I go into chapter three and beyond, but to sort of end with this thesis statement. So I wrote it up and I'm gonna read it verbatim because it's powerful. Again, this is 1970s and it's on page 55. But in all of the subsequent and more detailed discussions, the emphasis will be put firmly on the physical characteristics of the flows we want to use in the design, right? This stuff, the physical characteristics. This may seem antiquated and old fashioned, I love it, uh, at the time when, at a time when computational aerodynamics is coming to the fore. Well, gosh, it's 2024 and yes, computational aerodynamics has always increased and, and there's a lot of things that we've done and, and new, new things we've been able to achieve because of computational fluids, but it is, has never yet come close to being the panacea and you know, AI is not gonna do it and you know, GPU computing is not gonna do it. So this is this statement is actually still true today, okay? So even at a time when computational aerodynamics has come to the fore, and when there is a growing belief given big enough computers that all our problems will be solved numerically. Again, um, those of the 1970s, this is still not true. The approach adopted here does not follow this trend. Many approximate methods will be described simply because they bring out clearly the essentials of the behaviors of the flows in crucial and critical regions. That, that, that's why I love this book. That's why I love all the extra math he's gonna get into because it, it gives you these ideas of what things have to happen. And it's honestly why I'm teaching this because I want all of those things burned into my brain. I'm already seeing, it's only chapter two and I'm already seeing the value of, uh, of me lecturing in order to burn it into my brain. Uh, it's fantastic. And, uh, behaviors of the flows in critical and crucial regions because they give a sound basis for the design. Computers like wind tunnels are welcome and much needed tools, but they do not make physical insight redundant. I will wait for the screen to come back. There we go. They do not make physical insight redundant. So a great conclusion to chapter two, and we're going to dig into chapter three with a whole bunch more math. We'll see you there.